Blog Talk Radio. ¿Te cuándo?
I don't like to use the word teacher. I'll be your, um, I guess I will say teacher for now. I'll be a teacher for today. And your reader will be Brother Zerubbabel. And today we have an interesting topic. Um, before we get started, like I said, this is the What Is To Be Done radio show. We are the brothers from the Knesset of Jesus, Congregation of Israel, in affiliation with the Nazarene Messianic Party. This radio show deals with religio-political education, addressing current events, culture, history, and social problems with solutions brought to the table. Okay. You can visit our YouTube site, Knesset Yeshua, also Zadok Ben Israel, as well as Seven Hammer and Battle Act, as well as Sister Beniah, and also the Nazarene Ebion Party. All these have various teachings, biblical, political teachings. Okay, today we will be dealing with political education, or should I say, political economic education, which um, which for most of our listeners, you know, we, we strictly come out of the Bible and we will be coming with a few scriptures today, but we will mainly be teaching and educating, should I say, the uh, working class today because, <clears throat> you know, you have a lot of people out there who take <clears> – <throat> The Bible is just a religious Bible, you know, and I don't believe it to be religious. I believe it to be heavy, heavily politically influenced. Okay. For example, Christ Jesus is a king. Don't or aren't kings involved in politics? Okay, that's right. There's another scripture in the uh, in the in the in the Bible that says a government will lay upon his shoulders. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we see government, king. These, these type of positions deal with policies, which is politics. Okay, what about policies? What do policies do? Policies are acts and laws that govern a people. That's right. Not only the actions, but even the economy. Okay, so it's no surprise when Jesus comes and say, "Woe to the rich, and blessed be the poor." And his whole walk is about helping the oppressed, which is the poor, because his kingdom, which he is trying to establish, or which he is establishing, should I say? Is a is a utopia where everybody is taken care of, and policies need to be in place to push that forward. That's right. Okay, so again, the title of today's lesson is "Capitalism and the Worker: Alienation, Where Humans Are No Longer Human." So today we will be dealing with the aspect of the capitalist mode of production. Okay, which is just how the necessities of life are produced. When I say mode of production, that's what I mean. And Lord willing, you know, I deal with a, a mostly biblical um, audience. So Lord willing, as I read some of this stuff, I will be breaking down the terms that are not easily understood. And also, uh, take in mind that religion... As a, uh, uh, you have to understand the difference between religion and politics, because it's just like religion is a group of morals, which in America we have a group of morals. They have, you know, commandments say you shouldn't kill, right? That's the law. Uh -huh. You break that law, you could be punished for it, but it depends on how the law is applied. Mm -hmm. So somebody could have the same morals. But how it was applied throughout that society is what shows the politics and the government. That's right. So we we got to understand that. 
Exactly. That is correct. And one thing that I don't, and what I'm going to go over today, I think, is only known by a small percentage of people. And most of these, I would say, deal with socialist and communistic principles, okay, and, and dive into the studies of communistic and socialistic principles. That's right. And, you know, you have a bunch of people out here that call themselves revolutionaries. You have people who are Bible believers, who believe in Jesus, and also support or uphold capitalism. Yeah. Okay. Which is a uh, oxymoron. Which is an oxymoron. That <laughs> is a good point, my brother. It's an oxymoron. Okay. You cannot fight for freedom of a people and claim and and, and profess capitalism. That's right. It's like the USA saying you can you shouldn't kill and you shouldn't rob, but they go around to other countries. And killing kill around all the time. I was just watching a, a a movie the other day called Captain Phillips with Tom Hanks, mm -hmm. and it's talking about how you know these pirates in Somalia be taking over these ships. Sure. I said, do you understand? Well, I was talking to my wife and kids. I said, do you understand why these Somalians are going after these American ships? There you go. It, because the the powers that be are robbing them of their resources. Okay, mm -hmm. which in turn makes them have to go out and rob. Okay, That's right. and, and and do these acts of uh, piracy. But let's get to the topic at hand. Cause and effect. Cause and effect. Okay, but the topic at hand is capitalism and the worker, and we're specifically dealing with the working class today because I know most of my audience, if not all, are in the working class. And the working class is a political economic term, okay, because most people don't understand what the working class is, okay? The working class are those who sell their labor to make ends meet. You sell yourself, okay? Christ, who do you think Christ went to in his revolution? Because we understand not only was Christ a political a political uh, leader, but he was also a revolutionary. And in his revolution, he went to the working class. Okay? That's right. You see, he went to the fishermen, the tax collectors, those who were being oppressed. Okay? To help correct the policy makers, which were the so-called Sanhedrin. Okay? And your Pharisees and your Sadducees. But what we're going to do is fast forward it. We're going to press the fast forward button. And we're going to look at the intricacy of the workplace today from a, uh, one of the great minds of politics and economics. We'll look at some of uh, Karl Marx's writings, okay, which even capitalists use to this day to exploit the workers. They use Karl Marx, who was a proclaim communist, his writings to learn how to better work within the system of capitalism. Because Karl Marx did a thorough six volume breakdown with about 700 pages mm -hmm. of the capitalist system. Okay. And a lot of what was written is backed up by capitalists themselves. So, but before we start, <clears throat> We're going to go in the, the book of Matthew, okay, because I have a biblical audience, so I'm trying to educate them on the politics and economics of what they are in today. And we're going to find out another word for capitalism is something that is about to be said here in Matthew chapter 6. Pick it up at verse 19. And I see I do have a caller with a question. Just hold on and I'll get to you, brother. Matthew 6, verse 19. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt. So, 
the Messiah is saying, don't lay treasures up for yourselves upon earth. Why? What, what's the benefit of laying treasures? If you get treasures, yeah. okay, that means someone else is losing in the first place, okay? That's right. In order for one to gain, one has to lose. And we'll notice that when we break down the, the workplace, okay? In order for one to gain, one has to lose. So you're storing up these these riches and that you that is a loss for another person, and you might not be there to see it the next day, okay? But lay not up yourselves treasures upon earth, but what? Where moth does rust, where moth and rust does corrupt. Because not only does moth and rust corrupt, but the treasures themselves bring corruption. Mm-hmm. Okay? Go ahead. And where thieves break through and steal. Uh-huh. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. Okay. Verse 21. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. I want you to hop down to verse 24. No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other. Or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. No man can serve two masters. Okay? You cannot serve the creator. Okay? Which is righteousness. And serve mammon. Which is capitalism. My teacher told me uh, last week. Or he taught a bunch of us. Another word for capitalism is mammonism. Mm-hmm. Okay? You can't serve man. We live in a, in a mammonism society. Okay? And the Messiah is telling us that we can't serve the creator and serve man. Okay? But I'll tell you today, any of us in the working class serve man. Okay? Anybody who is in the working class, we are serving man. Mm-hmm. And we're serving this mammonism or this capitalism or this capitalist society. What do I mean? Let's hop over to Romans 6 and read one verse because Paul's going to make it plain for us. And we're about to hop into some history of what mammon does to us. Okay? Romans 6 verse 16. Just read that one verse. Know ye not that to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey? Know ye not that whom you yield yourselves servants to obey. So whoever you yield yourself servants to obey, what did Paul say? His servants, ye are to whom you obey. His servants. Whether of No, that that's good. Whoever you yield yourself your body and your members to obey, those are who you are serving. That is your master. So if you lend your body over to this capitalist system where the Messiah just said you can't serve mammon, okay, and serve the creator, whatever you call the creator and whatever you think the creator is, if you yield your members' servants over to mammonism, that's who you serve, okay? Mm -hmm. You're, You're willingly doing this. That's what all your thoughts consist of. Exactly. That's what uh, your whole being. Your whole being consists of. I was talking to a brother at work, and he worked in Homeland Security. And and he, uh, hold on one moment. I'm sorry. Hold on one moment. All right. I'm sorry about that, Wade. But I was talking to a brother in Homeland Security, and I was like, did you have a good weekend? You know, they had Fourth of July this weekend, and they had a long week, and I said, how was your weekend? He said, "You know, it was uh, it was all right, but you know, my mind my my mind was on work the whole weekend. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? Because you are consumed in this capitalist in this capitalist uh, mode of production, which we will get into further. Okay, but with that, and just proving that we are servants of this system, if you yield yourself over to serve it because what you what we're going to learn is you just become a cog and a wheel in the system when you are a worker 
But right now, before we get to the modern day system, we're going to hop back about 1,400 years. I mean, we could hop all the way back to ancient Babylon, down through Egypt, up through Greece, to Rome, to modern day. Mm-hmm. And it's all the same system. They've been following the same, what, pretty much art or science? Same art, yeah, yeah. or science. Just a mutation and a, a advancement of the same economic exploitation. Okay? And we're going to see what happens to it at the end of this teaching. But right now we're going to go into some history. And this book is a people's history of the United States, okay, from 1492 to present. So, but we're going to pick it up in 1492 because I was going to start out in Daniel in the Bible and just run down the uh, Daniel's dream of this beastly system and why he described these systems as beasts. Has anybody ever thought of that? Why? Why did Daniel describe these systems as beasts? Because we know it's a vision. Maybe it's because of how the, the people in that society and in those governments act. Maybe like beasts and like animals. Hmm. A beast mentality. Okay. And let's see, as we read right here this history, a people's history of the United States, let's see what, what it, the truth about when Christopher Columbus came. Okay, and what he did with these people, and who was the civilized people? Because today we say we live in a civilized society. That's right. You understand? Well, let's see who were the civilized people, because civilized means uh, more advanced in social and moral uh, abilities, okay, Mm -hmm. a society. Well, let's see who's morally advanced in this case. You can start... uh, Chapter 1, page 1 in the People's History, Columbus, the Indians, and the Human Progress. Let's listen to this real quick. Arawak men and women. Arawak men and women. Arawak Indians were the first encountered by so-called Christopher Columbus. Okay. Arawak men and women. Go ahead. Naked, tawny, and full of wonder, emerged from their villages onto the island's beaches and swam out to get a closer look. At the strange big boat. Uh huh. When Columbus and his sailors came ashore carrying swords, speaking oddly, the Arawaks Arawaks ran to greet them, brought them food, water, gifts. He later wrote of this in his log. Okay, now Christopher Columbus is going to explain, but look what the Arawak Indians did when they first seen these, these uh, exploiters coming on these ships. Okay. What did they do? They ran out and did what? They ran to greet them. Ran to greet them and give them food. Food. Okay. Water. Water. Gifts. Gifts. We're about to learn this is a giving. This is a civilized society. Okay. But but what we're taught in this capitalist society is that they were barbarous and savage. Is that? But we're about to learn who's the real savage because we're going to see who serves mammon and who doesn't in this situation. This is what I want to bring out. Go ahead and uh, what what did Christopher write? They brought us pads, the balls of cotton, and spears, and many other things, which they exchanged for the glass beads and hawks bells. Uh They willingly traded everything they owned. They were well built with good bodies and handsome features. They do not bear arms and do not know them, for I showed them a sword. They took it by the edge and cut themselves out of ignorance. So they didn't even know war. And the scriptures say that man, there will be a time when man learns war no more. Because of this mentality that they had, okay? But they lived on the Bahama Island, so I, they weren't surrounded by other Indian tribes. But go ahead. They have no iron. Their spears are made of cane. They will make fine servants. With 50 men, we could subjugate them all and make them do whatever we want. So look at the mentality of somebody who lives in mammonism or capitalism, which was Christopher Columbus. And look at the mentality of a person who doesn't live in a capitalist society, which were these Indians. They were free to give. Mm -hmm. But the mentality of the capitalist was, man, we could subjugate them. We could take them captive, okay, and make them do whatever we want for what? For gain. That's right. Okay. Because this is the mentality. 
And this is all a setup to what we are in today, which we will get into. Keep reading. These Arawaks of the Bahama Islands were much like Indians on the mainland, uh -huh. who were remarkable. European observers were to say again and again, for their hospitality, their belief in sharing. Their belief in what? Sharing. That belief in sharing doesn't come with a capitalist mentality. Okay. Right. Capitalism teaches you go out and get for yourself. Go out and be the best you can be. Okay. Mm -hmm. These Indians, all they knew was sharing. They didn't know about let's go dig mines for gold. Okay. This is the mind of a, a of a, 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 a people who live after man. That's right. What kind of politics is that? What they said, they rush out and instead of with wars, like they got to uh, protect themselves, they rush out and uh, with gifts. With gifts. This is what we need to come back to, all these people who claim to be conscious. Okay? This is what mankind needs to come back to, if we are going to live in peace with all men. But go ahead and finish this, and I'll get to these questions here in a second. These traits did not stand out in the Europe of the Renaissance, Mm -hmm. dominated as it was by the religion of popes, the government of kings, the frenzy for money. Hold on, before you read the frenzy for money. He said these traits of sharing yeah. did not stand out in Europe. Okay, why? Because as we read before even these Europeans existed, we read Christ said you cannot serve God, which is full of righteousness and doing right to people. That's right. And mammon, which is greed. Lust for money. Mm-hmm. What you say? The lust for power. The lust for power. Okay. Yeah. Which all this is going to lead into how the workers are treated today. Okay. This is we're leading up to something. But he said the shame did not exist in Europe. Go ahead. The frenzy for money. The frenzy for money. That, Damn it. That marked Western civilization in his first messenger to the Americas, Christopher Columbus. So the frenzy of money is what marked Western civilization from that point on, okay? And it was brought by your best friend, Christopher Columbus, okay? <laughs> which, is, which they got a day for, okay? Christopher Columbus Day, uh, all right? I want you to start here, but uh, let me let me get to these callers real quick, see if they had a question real quick or did they want to wait? Three, two, three. Did you have a question right now, or were you uh, just listening? Is that me? Yeah, that's you. Okay. This is John Ezekiel. No, I'm, I'm, I'm. I don't have a question. Well, maybe I do have a question. Um, you know, you talk about the history of the of the capitalist system, and um, and how you know people that are caught up in this have a tendency to be manipulative. Uh, they use people, they don't share, et cetera, et cetera. But I find it interesting that those that worship Jesus are right dab in the middle of that capitalist system. That is to say that the Romans, whose very purpose was to conquer the world, and the Catholic Church, who decided they wanted to conquer Rome and the world, had deliberately manipulated the word of Elohim for capitalist purposes, starting with Amen. inventing, starting with inventing the pagan Jesus. Jesus uh, hey. does not exist, and they created a graven image, called it Isis. The arrogant Western world, having come up with the J sound, decided to change that to Jesus. But the whole purpose of this Jesus is to uh, beguile money out of people. For example, the uh, tribe of Levi does not exist anymore. So there's no one to pay a tithe to. This is scripture. Mm -hmm. And so there being no one to pay a tithe to, those who are worshiping Jesus are being convinced that they should pay tithes. And the greater amount of this money is used to fulfill the earthly desire of a leader of those that are believing in this pagan God. So I suggest, I submit, in fact, I know that one of the ways to get to that place to where we 
um, truly put our treasures in heaven is to come into the truth that Yahashua is the Messiah, to reach enough truth to be able to denounce the pagan Jesus, to know that when you say God, according to uh, Saul, uh, who the Catholics call Paul, he says there are many gods in heaven and in earth. Mm-hmm. And when we call Yahashua God, we violate Torah because the first commandment of Torah is that you will have no other God in my presence. He says, I have a name, and it's not God. When you say God, you're talking about any one of them. Who knows how many demons and devils there are out there at the will of Satan. So every time we do that, we insult the Father and put ourselves into lawlessness and thus don't have the ear for what the love of money means. But this is the essence of the love of money. As I was telling you on, on Facebook, I'm about to do a writing about this. I've been doing some research about this. And it turns out that the essence of the love of money is the lack of the love of Yahuwah. Okay. And I agree. So, so, so let me get this straight before I uh, respond to your comments. You do believe in Yeshua. That's correct? Absolutely. Yeah. Yahushua, yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Okay. And you do That's believe like, in the I, people. I, so you believe, you, you believe that Yeshua, the Christ, was against capitalism. Do you believe that? Well, first of all, um, my walk is not based on belief. Uh, Yahatab, James, uh, the brother of Yahushua, he says that, you say you believe there is one God, well, you do well, but demons believe and tremble. So I'm really not impressed with your belief. He says that, can your faith save you? Faith and belief without knowledge are worthless. You're just pretty much doing the speak, operating in the book of wonder. When you believe in things that you don't understand and then you suffer, superstition is the way. That's the book of wonder, chapter 6, verse 7. <laughs> but um, That's what, what I do... So then you know well, what I do know, what I, what I know <laughs> is that Yahushua is the Messiah. Christ is a pagan God as well, in and apart from the pagan Jesus. But the lack of knowledge is causing people not to know this, and they're falling right into the plan of Satan, even though they don't even realize it. In, in the book of John, you know, uh, when, and he says, this is the condemnation. That light came into the world, and the world, let me see if I can get the scripture up real quick. I'll just share this real quick with you. Um, he said, this is the condemnation that light has come into the world, and the world has not received it. Hold on a second. Yeah, I want to John point out Reed. something. Yeah. I want to point out something in that, in that, um, in that scripture. Okay. Why, uh, in, those why set of, in those set of scriptures. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. It didn't take long. Um. He said, this is the condemnation, that light has come to the world, and men, and men love darkness rather than the light, because their deeds were evil. And what I wanted to point out in this thing about, in that first verse, this word evil uh, means that it, it's the Greek word paneros. And it basically means that they're so busy living their lives, going to work, making money, feeding the family, you know, buying clothes, cars, material stuff. They're so busy doing this stuff that they miss the hand of Elohim in operation. But then in the, in the next verse, when it says, for everyone that doeth evil hates the light, well, that's not the same Greek word as paneros. Um, that word, um, hold on a second, I just lost, I just lost the translation here. No problem. Here it is. Um, That word essentially means that they don't have the heart of Elohim uh-huh. and have beside it. And, and when the light came that reveals that they don't have the heart of Elohim, they reject the truth because the truth reveals that they're not who they thought they were. So the love of money... In, in the first verse, in 19, tells us that we're so busy trying to get it, we cannot identify with the Father. 
Exactly. <laughs> okay. Uh, and and again, I, I I submit to you that so I I, I, I when you ask me the question, do I be, do I believe that the Messiah? I don't know anything about. I mean, what I know about Christ is that it's it's of the devil. So I won't even address the thing about Christ. But okay. Um, what I know is the Messiah absolutely did not believe in or stand on um, capitalism as his premise. Exactly. But he did. But he did understand that it existed and that it was of it was uh, um, in the world and of the world and had to be addressed. When they was when, they were, when he, he was saying, "Well, how are we going to pay our taxes?" He yeah. said, "Go down, and find the fish. There's money in the fish's mouth. Give on the Caesar what is due to Caesar." When another person was challenging him, he said, "Give me the coin." He said, "Whose image is on the coin?" They said, "Caesar." Give on the Caesar what is due Caesar. He recognized that capitalism was in the world, yeah, and that it was in fact of the world, but that those of us that are walking in truth of the true Messiah and the and the true Yahushua and the true Yahuwah, we know that we're not of this world. Definitely. And so and so as rich as we may may uh be or become, if we do not maintain an understanding that this is not where our treasures lie, then we missed the boat completely. More than likely, we're in darkness. If you can't, if you don't, if you haven't figured that out, you're probably in some form of darkness, and you're not going to make it into heaven anyway. Amen, brother. So, uh, yeah, you made some excellent points. Some points I disagree with, but uh, for the most part, I agree with you. And hopefully, you'll stay on, and we could chat about the uh, the things that I did disagree with. Not as far as economics, but as far as the mm-hmm. semantics of the name. You know, we, yeah, uh, I'm, in, I'm, I'm looking willing. forward to getting into that myself. <laughs> yeah, so Lord willing, huh. and Lord willing, I don't offend you if I use the word God, Christ, and Jesus because I believe that it's the spirit behind it, not the actual word that you are uh, giving reverence to. Like, yes. what does the name Jesus mean? Like, uh, like what does Jesus mean? Yeah. What, what do you mean? Salvation. Yeah, Jesus just means salvation from the English. That, that's so, not. I mean, that's yeah. not. That's not. That's not true. Jesus is a translated. We are, we know from two. Number one, when the Romans came up with Aesius, and they literally came up with Aesius. And Aesius is Greek. It is it is not a translation. There's no such thing as, you know, I I don't know what your true name is, but I see the uh, the uh, the is it I I see blue. But let's just say your name is blue. Let's say your name is yeah. Marvin. Okay. Uh-huh. Um, when you go to Japan, your name's going to still be Marvin. If you go to Italy, your name's going to be Marvin. You go to Russia, your name's going to be Marvin. The same way Yitsi Yamamoto, and his name is Yitsi Yamamoto in Japan, and it's Yitsi Yamamoto here. My name is Jaja Azikwe. Is, is, that, is Jaja Azikwe in Nigeria? It's Jaja Azikwe here in America. It doesn't matter exactly. where you go. Your name is never going to change. The fact that yeah. they change the name, because, it, you know, I'm just going to, I just want to drop this one quick little nugget. Go ahead. Philipp, uh, Philippians chapter 9, verse 2. Uh-huh. And he exalted him. I'm, I'm quoting out of memory. He exalted him and gave him a name that is above every name. Yes. If a person says there is a name, how many names are we talking about? It's one. We're talking about one name, not two, not three. Yeah. Not the spirit of, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. He says, in any other name you come up with, this one name is above it. Well, that was in, Saul wrote that letter in 62 CE. Aesis didn't even exist. The graven image of Aesis did not exist. And Jesus absolutely did not exist. So the only I, I, name, I, I, he, yeah, so the only I, name he's talking about is the name of Yahushua. If we decide yeah. to change that name, he said, that name's not equal to Yahushua. There's okay. only two spirits in the world. One is of the devil and one is of the father. It's either of the I, father I, or it's of the devil. De- definitely, my brother. Let me, let, me put, let me put you on hold so I could uh, finish this lesson, but I, I definitely want to um, get back okay, into that conversation. 
All right. Okay, Thank you, my it. brother. All right. But one thing about the name that I did want to say is, like you said, he gave him a, a name greater than any other name, but he had a common name in Israel. That's right. So the name, he, he isn't referring to that common name he had. The name above every name is his character that was behind that name. That's what made his name so great, his kingly, his, his kingly character. That's why he is. Uh, he has a name. When you make a name for yourself, it's because of what you did, not because of your title that people call you. So that's what we understand name to be, what's behind the so-called letters. So I just wanted to express that as I go on, and then we'll definitely get into it. But right now we're, we're comparing a capitalist mentality uh, opposed to a communal, which, which, which the Messiah brought, a communal mentality. Go ahead and pick it up right here, and everything underlined. Okay. So, or just no. Matter of fact, this first paragraph. So, approaching land, they were met by the yeah. Ar Arawak. Arawak Indians, uh -huh. who swam out to greet them. Mm -hmm. The Arawaks live in village commune. So, the Arawaks live in communes. Go ahead. Had a developed agriculture of corn, yams, cassava. Uh -huh. They could spin and weave. So they knew how to make their own clothes. Go ahead. But they had no horses or work animals. Uh -huh. They had no iron, but they were tiny gold ornaments in their eggs. So they wore a few jewelry, okay? So as we go on, go ahead and uh, hop down that. The Indians, Columbus reported, are so naive and so free with their possessions. So the Columbus says the Indians are so free with their possessions. Isn't this what the Messiah was? Free with his possessions. That's correct. And this is what he taught his church to do. This is why in Acts 2, you see a, a, a group of believers come together and had all things in common. Mm -hmm. They were unlike these capitalists, these mammonists, okay, uh -huh. who believed in mammonism. Ordering. Order. And when you become free and giving, you become naive. Okay, but in the capitalist system, they'll call you naive because you get sucked out of uh, giving your possessions to somebody because you're so naive. But that's yeah. why you was naive. That's because the world around you is so wicked. But when you're surrounded by giving and sharing, naive doesn't even come in your mind. I mean, what is naive? That That is quickly eliminated. But go ahead. Are so naive and so pre with their possessions that no one who had not witnessed them would believe it. When you ask for something, they have. They never say no. To the contrary, they offer to share with anyone. So they offer to share with anyone. That is opposite of capitalism, where you are to keep your possessions, okay? Where you are to hoard your possessions. That is what capitalism teaches, okay? Now, I just want you to read this last uh, paragraph, and then we'll hop into analytic research of the worker. All of this is told in the Spanish own accounts. In Peru, the other Spanish conquistador, Pizarro, used the same tactic and for the same reason. The frenzy in the early capitalist states of Europe for gold, for slaves, for products of the soil, to pay the bondholders and stockholders for the expedition. So the frenzy mentality of Europe, meaning for gold, for slaves, you're seeking for mammon. What what ended up happening, what we skipped over, is they would they would imprison and enslave these Indians for the sake of wealth. And when your mind is on mammon, this is how you turn out, barbaric, bar barbarians, basically, you understand? But they call this the, the European lifestyle civilized. Mm -hmm. And they'll call the civilized Indians barbarous. You're right. Okay, go finish that. Okay. To finance the monarchical bureaucracy rising in Western Europe, to spur the growth of the new money economy rising out of feudalism, to, partic to participate in what Karl Marx would later call the primitive accumulation of capital. These were the violent beginnings of an intricate system of technology, business, 
politics, and cultures that will dominate the world for the next five centuries. So what happened when Christopher Columbus and all these conquistadors came is what Karl Marx called the basically the primitive accumulation of capital, mm -hmm. okay, which is they started accumulating labor produced from slaves, okay, and – from what? Colonizing. Yeah, colonizing. And what he said was basically this type of mentality would dominate the world for the next five centuries. And we're living in one of those centuries. Okay? Now, that's all from the people's history. We're about to go into Karl Marx's analytical breakdown of the worker today because I wanted to bring that up just to show you we're going to fast forward to they were using slaves back then, but now we are even slaves today. But we're going to get into the psychi psychology of the slave and the mentality of the slave today. But before we do, I want to run to a scripture which most Christians, Hebrews, those who understand Yah, they run to the scripture to vindicate their capitalist ways and say, man, you know, I can go out and work for uh, FedEx and, uh, you know, this is what God tells us to do. Go to go to Second Thessalonians 3 and read verse 10. Okay, They take this verse out of context and say, you know, God told us to go get a job. Okay. Yeah. They're taking this scripture totally out of context. Because God never told you to go get a job in a capitalist society. That's right. Okay. He's talking about community, a community doing work here. Mm -hmm. But let's read this one scripture, 2 Thessalonians 3 and 10. Okay, 2 Thessalonians 3, verse 10. For even where we were with you, when we were with you, this we command you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly. So he said, what? If a man don't work, then he shouldn't eat. And they use this scripture. If a man don't work, he don't eat, man. That means I got to go get my job at uh, Mickey D's. I got to go work at FedEx. They, they uh, interpolate. They, and, there and, you go. Ain't that the word? They interpolate. They, they take something in out of context from one part of the Bible and put it into today's society. And that's what they teach in the uh Modern day so called Christian churches or what? What is that? Uh, if you don't work, you shouldn't eat. To, uh, trying to encourage people to exactly. go to his, uh, and Like the brother was saying, the modern Christian people who worship this Jesus, mm -hmm. okay, which promotes capitalism, which is not the Jesus I agree with, okay, they, they, use, that, they use that scripture exactly. to promote, man, you got to go to work. Right, and not even considering who you got to, if you start at chapter one and look it over, who was the book written to? Exactly, and who was he talking? He's talking to a community. That's right. There you okay, go. a community of people who have came together and shared their resources and telling them, you're not just going to sit around and eat off all the other people without putting in your and share work. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if a man don't work in our community, guess what? He don't eat. There you go. Okay. He does not eat. So we we can X that scripture out of these uh, so-called Bible believers who use the scripture to say, man, you know, you need to get a job in this capitalist system. <laughs> okay. What we're about to learn right now for, this, for the next 45 minutes is the intricacies of the worker in a capitalist system. Okay. And we're going to dive into a man who broke down the capitalist system system so well that even capitalists use his book today. And he was anti-capitalist. This is called the Economic and Philosophic Manuscripts of 1844 by Karl Marx. Okay? Before I start, let me let me ask let me uh take this next brother. He had a question. Uh three one seven, did you have a question or comment before I uh move on? Three one seven. Sure. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. 
Uh, no, brother. I, did I press the one button? I, I told you that running. Yeah, okay, you didn't have a question. I'm sorry. Uh, no, no, sir. My, my phone's been, I was acting up, so I dropped off, you know, two, six, three times. Okay, I'll put you back. Oh, then no problem. Okay. All right. So what, what we're about to dive into is the Economic and Philosophic Manuscripts of 1844 by Karl Marx. Now, a lot of biblical readers do not read these political economic uh, breakdowns of how the mentality of the worker is today, okay, in our society, and how we are alienated from our work. This is what we're about to go into, the alienation, how we how we are even alienated from mankind in this mammonist system, in this capitalist system, okay? So before I go on, we're just going to read some of these quotes. And some of these quotes come from a guy named Adam Smith, who was a capitalist, mm -hmm. who Karl Marx studied his capitalist writings and critiqued and went even further in depth into the breakdown of capitalism. So uh, just the underline right here. But that's one of their main philosophers, huh, Adam Smith? Adam Smith is a normal capitalist, okay? Just the underline. The lowest and the only necessary wage rate is then providing for the subsistence of the worker, the, sub, the subsistence of the worker for the duration of his work, and as much more as is necessary for him to support a family and for the race of laborers not to die out. So not to die out. This is the, when you work in a capitalist society, he says the lowest and the only necessary wage mm -hmm. to pay you is that providing for your basic needs, your subsistence, your subsistence of the worker and the duration of his work, meaning for how long you're going to work for me, okay? And maybe for a little bit to, for you to take care of your family. Mm -hmm. But what we're going to learn and what's going to be repeated is that in a capitalist society, the worker is paid minimal. Why? So when he runs out, guess where he has to come? Right back. Right back. Right back. Okay. What they call? What do they call that when they send the uh, that minimum? Or what they what they call that? What minimum wage? So they, there you go. Minimum wage. Minimum wage. So, we, but even even ten eleven dollars is minimum. You understand? There you go. Even though the minimum wage might be eight, but finish that off because we're gonna keep going. The ordinary wage, according to Smith, is the lowest compatible with common humanity. This is a catalyzed existence. So he said the way you get paid today, the lowest wage, is is uh, equal to a cattle-like existence. So humans today in a capitalist society and in a capitalist mode of production are treated like cattle. Mm -hmm. Okay? If you ever watched uh, The Matrix, and there's a part where Neo walks out in the streets and uh, and he notices once he has taken the uh, pill, how all these people are just like sheep, walking to and from their jobs. You mm -hmm. understand? Just like cattle. Okay. Even if we put it into modern times, your cattle plow the field for you, and what do you give them? Just enough for them to maintain. Yes, sir. Okay. This is the same way the people who own you today, your boss, your worker give to you just to maintain your life. So you gotta come back. Okay. Cattle like existence. Top over the page twenty four. And trust me, it's gonna get deeper. Just underline. Since the worker has sunk to the level of a machine, he can be confronted by the machine as a competitor. So again, mm. Adam Smith is saying since the worker has sunk to the level of a machine, guess what? Guess who you competing with? Now, if you work at a fast food or, say, a Kroger or a Tom Thumb, a Walmart, you a cashier. You have been reduced to a machine because you are just an extension of that cash register, okay? And who's that competition? And, and who the competition for the cashiers today? Those self-checkout lines. That's right. Okay? Those self-checkout lines are competing with real human lives. That's correct. Because those real human lives have been reduced to a dang machine. Mm -hmm. Okay? 
This is advanced capitalism we're getting into. This is what, what, what the Messiah was dealing with. But all that was the same system, just a, 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 a reforming has taken place, okay? Since, however, according to Smith... According to Smith, who was a chief capitalist writer, according to his own writing, go ahead. A society is not happy. A society is not happy that what? Of which the greater part suffers. Yet even the wealthiest state of society leads to the suffering of the majority. Even the greatest nation, he is saying, leads to what? The suffering of the majority. The suffering of the majority. This is what happened in your Rome. This is what happened in your ancient Egypt, right? That's, that, right. that's what people lift up, ancient Egypt. Any society, that is, any nation that is wealthy has majority poor people. Mm -hmm. Okay? And he said the, a, a wealthy nation is not a happy, is a society that is not happy. Not happy. Okay? Because the majority are what? Uh, suffer. Are suffering or treated like cattle. That's right. Okay. And what? And what, they had minimum wage in Egypt too. They, they had minimum wage. Did. What? Bread and beer. Bread and beer. You That's you right. building great pyramids for one man who is mm -hmm. supposedly God in Egypt. Okay. But you reduced to bread and beer. Bread and beer. To build these great monuments. Okay. That was capitalism even back in uh, ancient Egypt. And we can go back to Babylon and Nimrod. Yes. Nimrod in some books was called the first imperialist. Okay? Imperialism is the highest form of capitalism or mammonism. Okay? You finish that off? Yeah, even the wealthiest state of society leads to the suffering of the majority. And since the economic system, and in general, a society based on private interests, uh -huh. leads to this wealthiest condition, it follows that the goal of the economic system is the unhappiness of society. So the goal of the economic system that is wealthy, like capitalism, like America, its goal is that the is the unhappiness of society. That's right. And society is unhappy, even today. Okay. And the Messiah, Yeshua, the Messiah came to reverse all this, what we are going through today. And people always take Messiah off in the spiritual realm like, I'm talking about he's just a being sitting up somewhere. No. If the Messiah is in you, he has sent you to come down here and change this. That's why we today right. are trying to wake up the people. Okay? And not just wake them up, but put our hands to the plow. Okay? And get things done because if the Messiah resides in you, you should be doing that work. Okay? Mm -hmm. Keep breathing. He tells us that originally and in theory, the whole produce of labor belongs to the worker. This is what the, the capitalist Adam Smith tells you, that the whole product that a worker makes belongs to the worker. Okay? So you saying they ain't paying us enough. They, they they are not paying you enough. That that's exactly what I'm saying. Oh man, there there would be no way a capitalist would pay you to leave with the object you produce. Okay, that that just wouldn't happen. So you saw the laborers in Egypt, they didn't get a fair share in that pyramid. They did not get a fair share because anything you create, you own. This is this is what this is what the essence of human nature is, which we'll get into a little bit later. But keep going. But at the same time, he tells us that in actual fact, what the worker gets is the smallest. So although the worker is supposed to get his labor, whatever I make, if I make a, a hamburger, I put that together. Okay, mm -hmm. that hamburger is mine. Maybe the boss paid for the the uh, the items. That's right. Okay, so he gets the items. But if I never make the hamburger, his items are just gonna sit there, and he couldn't sell it for a, a dollar. Yeah, okay, yeah. or whatever I, whatever my labor was to sell that burger, without me in the process of making it, that value would have never jumped up. Mm -hmm. Okay, so he gets the uh, the first money that he put in for. Yeah, he get whatever he them items that he bought. Yeah, he gets that. But the anything else that I put in is strictly to the worker. This there is you go. the first understanding of economics. Okay. Labor, all labor, 
whatever I make belongs to me, not to another man. Because you put the value in. Because I put the value in. Mm-hmm. For example, if let me just make it clear for people. If I make a book, okay, and say the capitalist gets the wood to make the pages, okay, mm-hmm. and say it costs him five dollars, and I make the book right out of his wood he got, mm-hmm. and after I'm finished with the book, the book costs fifty dollars. Yeah. If we sell it for fifty dollars, the work I put in. I would get forty five and the the whoever paid for the the material. The capital advance. That yeah, that cap that five dollars. That's all he would get. That's all they get. But in capitalism, yeah. he gets the whole fifty and he paid me five dollars. That's right. <laughs> Which is backwards according to political economics. Mm-hmm. Okay, but go ahead. We're, and we're learning this from a capitalist mind. Go ahead. But at the same time, he tells us that an actual fact What the worker gets is the smallest and utterly indispensable part of the product. He gets the smallest part of the product. Like I just told you, we should be getting the majority because the labor we put in it is what made the the price jump in the first place. It's what brings the value to the product, okay? But we get the smallest according to this capitalist. This isn't even Karl Marx. Karl Marx quoting somebody else's book. Is that it on that? Is that the end of that paragraph? Uh, Go ahead. As much only as is necessary for his existence, not as a man, but as a worker, and for the propagation, not of humanity, but of the slave class of workers. So what the capitalists give you, enough just to live, and not to procreate humanity, but just to pro- procreate the working class. Mm-hmm. Okay. This is what we're learning from a known capitalist, a said capitalist, uh, 27, underline. But when society is in a state of progress. When, when we learned this other when a society is in a state of progress, like capitalism, like mammonism, like ancient Rome was in the Messiah's days, mm-hmm. okay, like Egypt was in Moses' days, mm-hmm. the same mammonist system, when society is in a state of progress, what? The ruin and impoverishment of the worker is the product of his labor and of the wealth produced by him. So the impoverishment of what makes the worker poor, okay, is the product of his own hands. Now, I know this is hard for some people to understand right now, but we will break it down here shortly. How is the worker getting poorer by the work of his own hands? Go ahead. And what? And, uh, and okay, and the, the misery results, therefore, the misery. misery results, therefore, from the essence of present day labor itself. So the misery of the worker, okay, comes from the, 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 his own hands, okay, and we're going to learn this when we get to the first part of alienation, which when we say alienation, we're not talking about aliens from outer space, okay? We're not talking about uh, uh, Mexicans and other people from other nations, okay, coming over. When I say alienation, what I'm talking about and what economists are talking about, okay, and what Marx is talking about is the process whereby the worker is made to feel foreign to the product of his own labor. Okay, to, you're foreign to the works of your hand because what we're going to come to find out is Marx says what makes us human is that we produce things with our own hands for our own pleasures. Okay, this is what makes humanity human. We think and we fashion things out of nature because nature is just an extension of human, okay, of, of the human because we must live off of nature. That's right. Okay, so what we fashion belongs to us, but in a capitalist society, which dates back to Nimrod. Oh, it can go way Well, it can go back before that, before the flood. We can go back to uh, Cain if we wanted to. There you go. Okay, and prove it. That the work of your own mind and your own hands does not belong to you. Now, how unnatural is that? We will see in a second how unnatural that is. Okay. 
But go ahead with that. Okay. Uh, it, <clears throat> I think it's over there. Yeah, it goes without saying that the proletarian, in other words, the proletarian, which is just a, a economic word for the worker. The proletarian is a worker. Go ahead. The man who, being without capital and rent, lives purely by labor. So the proletarian lives purely by labor. And this is what most of the people I'm talking to today online and whoever's listening, are, most of y'all are workers. Okay, most of y'all live by selling your physical labor, your life energy, okay, that you put into something. Mm -hmm. You're selling that to someone else. Okay, go ahead. And by a one sided, abstract labor is considered by political economy only as a worker. So you're viewed in political economy as a worker. Go ahead. Political economy can therefore advance the proposition that the proletarian the same as any horse uh -huh. must get as much as will enable him to work. So in political economy, the capitalist and communist alike consider the worker just like any horse that gets the bare sustenance that he needs to reproduce and to keep on working. Okay? And which we'll learn which we will learn later learn is that this will stunts the growth of humanity and retards humanity. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because we our, our our function, what makes us human, belong to someone else. So we can never reach our full human potential. So we devolve them. We devolve, not <laughs> evolve. Good point. Twenty nine. Just just this underline. But political economy knows the worker only as a working animal. Only as a what? Working animal. So when political economists start to study the worker in a capitalist society, the worker is only comparable to an animal. Therefore, we are no longer human. Okay? No longer human. Just like, a, like, just like the slaves back in, in any society you could think of. Okay? Or well, most slaves, I want to say, because some slaves were treated right, and we wouldn't even call them slaves, we'd call them servants. Mm -hmm. Okay, but go ahead. As a beast reduced to the strict, strictest bodily need uh -huh. to develop in greater spiritual freedom, a people must break their bondage to their bodily need. They must cease to be the slaves of the body. So, again, we're learning. We must break from just getting our bodily needs met in order to grow spiritually, mentally. This is what he's saying. When he says spiritually, he's talking about mentally. Okay. And today we just have a lot of time bodily wants. Bodily wants. Okay. Yep. That, that is correct. In order to live, uh -huh. then the non-owners are obliged to place themselves. Directly or indirectly. So the non-owners are the workers because workers do not own anything but their own labor. Mm -hmm. That's all they can sell. Okay, in the in the scope of political economy. So in order to live, these non-workers are obliged or place themselves directly or indirectly. Go ahead. At the service of the owners to so put themselves, that is to say, into a position of dependence upon them. So. We are to depend on the owners. That's right. Well, the owners of industry in capitalism, mm -hmm. okay, which we call bosses, okay, or which political economists call capitalists, okay. That's right. To hire out one's labor, to lend one's labor at interest, mm -hmm. to work in another's place, to hire out the materials of labor. To lend the materials of labor at interest to make others work in one's place. Mm. Such an economic order condemns man to occupation so mean, to a degradation so devastating and bitter that by comparison, savagery seems like a kingly condition. So he said we are reduced to such terrible conditions that savagery mm -hmm. seems like a kingly condition. But remember, we just learned what they call savages is Indian back go. in the past. They said that looks like what? Kingly shit. Exactly. Okay. And that is kingly shit. 
what them, how them Indians were living and, and sharing. Right. So what the, what we see going on today and what a feudalist society, that's not true kingship. A true king cares about the people. Mm-hmm. And lives for the people, as we've seen the Messiah. That's right. Who even died for the people. Okay. Let's go over to... Uh, you want to put this real quick? No, that's... Well, go ahead. Read that. Prostitution of the non-owning class in all its forms. So it's prostitution of the working class is what's going on in capitalism. Okay. But some people... I got brothers who I talk to on the phone that say, but you know, brother, we have the freedom to choose to work if we want to. Okay. But in capitalism, that is not the case. That is not the case at all because we're not free to work. We can't say, well, we don't, if we don't want to work. We're actually forced into work. We are forced into these contracts because one brother who believes in, you know, uh, one of my brothers, he believes in the uh, the Morris, you know, laws. And, you know, they believe in, you know, once you learn these laws, and they believe that you enter into contracts freely. So if you go to a boss and he tells you, well, I'm going to pay you $10, you entered into that contract freely. Right. Okay? So it's just for him to pay you bare minimum because you entered into that contract freely. But I hold him or I'm under the impression in that that is false. Okay? And that we're not freely entering into contracts. Why do I say that? Pick it up at 33. The large workshops prefer to buy the labor of women and children because this costs less than that of men. So we're talking about Karl Marx, who lived in the 1850s. So at this time, women and children were working 18-hour days, mm. sleep for six hours, wake back up, and work again. So the, he's talking about here that women and children were cheaper than men at this time. Go ahead. The worker is not at all in the position of a free seller. So the worker is not at all in the position of a what? Free seller. Why is that? Piece of this. The Vice one, versa is what, okay. basically what that means. Go ahead. The one who employs him, the capitalist is always free to use labor, uh-huh. and the worker is always forced to sell it. Why is the worker always forced to sell it? Do we, do we understand why the worker is always forced to sell because, like I said, a brother told me that we're not forced to sell our own labor. We freely enter into these contracts. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm going to read to you this book real quick, or a, a quote out of this book called Communism in the Bible by Jose Miranda. Communism in the Bible, page 26. Just the bracket, my brother. Why are we not, why are workers in this capitalist society? Because most people think we're free to sell our labor. We sell it freely. But we're actually not free to sell, as Karl Marx said, but let's listen to what Jose Miranda says in his book, Communism in the Bible. Next, the people who sell their labor, the people who sell their labor, the workers, uh-huh. when confronted with the employment offer you made them. So with, when they are confronted with this off, this business offer you made them, come work for me for $8 an hour, $15 an hour, what, what happened? Had as their only alternative. So the only alternative. Is what? Unemployment. Unemployment. Which what happens when you're unemployed? So Ooh. go ahead. You start stealing, you know you might get into a little robbery. You start stealing, robbing, but what man might put some dope in your hand. Exactly. But if something worse goes on. Go ahead. Let let Miranda finish. And the disasters of all kinds that go hand in hand with unemployment. Mm-hmm. In other words, either they have to sign your contract regardless of its terms or face hunger and family disaster along with their wives and their children. It is a grossest quay joke to talk about a free work contract. So it's, it's basically a joke to talk about a free work contract because we're forced with death, starvation, if we don't sign this $8 an hour contract because in a capitalist society, capitalism is built off of private property, where few people who own all the resources can buy up all the private property. That's right. Which is the means of production. We're not talking about your toothbrush, your bed. We're talking about means of production. The stuff they make all that with. Yeah, the stuff they make all that with. Exactly. 
okay? So you're forced to sell your labor in a, in a mammonist society, and this is why the Messiah said you cannot serve the Creator, and you cannot serve mammonists. Okay. okay. Now listen. Okay. No, that's good. Okay. This needs to be done I'm gonna read this on the line. Yeah. Uh, I'm not bad. I have read this. Yeah. Well, that that's good. That's good. good. On that. that's good. Yeah. Right. Now, we are going into alien nation. Okay, and, and like I said, by alienation, we mean how the worker is separated from not only his work, but his work process. Not only his work process, but from his humanity, from his human nature. Not only from his human nature, which, which Mark describes four types of alienation, but we'll only get into three. Okay, why is that? Because the fourth type is alienation from the working class, like you are alienated from other workers, meaning you are in a, a constant fight with other workers to get jobs. That's right. Okay. That's what uh, racism has a big part. Of. Exactly. But in the in the Indian economic system, the Indians work together. Mm -hmm. But in this society, you're pitting one against another to get a job, okay, and to get raises. So it's work against work. It's, just, it's a battle. It's a struggle, which you separate yourself from all these workers instead of working with. But that's, that's plain. I want to get into some deeper, or the, the three main aspects of alienation. Okay, so we understand when we're speaking to the working class, what, that, what, what situation they're in. Okay, and what they go through. Because we see we have been reduced to animals according to even known capitalists. Okay? Mm -hmm. Now, according to Marx, alienation is a systemic result of living in a socially stratified, stratified society. Be, because being a mechanistic part of a social class alienates a person from his or her humanity. So Marx is saying even social classes alienate you from your humanity. What does he mean? Well, when Egypt came, I mean, when Israel came out of Egypt, mm -hmm. they didn't have a social class. Mm -hmm. Everybody lived in the wilderness when they came out, first came out. Everybody had their own tent. Moses didn't say, I'm king. Y'all make me a big, big tent while y'all sleep in little huts. That's right. Everybody lived equally when they came out of this capitalist system of Egypt. What about food? Food was shared as every man had need. Even if you read the account of manna in Exodus 16, it will tell you those who gathered much didn't have much over. Those who gathered little didn't lack. Because the ones who gathered much had a big family, so they had to gather much. Those who gathered little only needed a little, so, and they never lacked. Everybody had, it says, according to all had need. Nobody was out there searching for mammon. Everybody lived according to what was needed. And this is what Karl Marx claims uh, in his utopia, okay, that man in, in a, a true economic society of equality, all men will work according to their ability, and all people will be distributed resources according to their needs. Okay, this is why so many people can relate Karl Marx to the utopian uh, kingdom that the Messiah is bringing. Okay, and, and Karl Marx's principles and his understanding lines up with the principles of the Messiah. That's undeniable. That's why there's so many people, well, I wouldn't say so many, there's a few who understand the politics of Christ. They line up with the politics of uh, Marx. Okay, so let me let me read this before we get into this alienation. These three types of alienation that the worker, how the worker is alienated from his product in capitalism, alienated from the work process in capitalism, and lastly, alienated from human kind. Okay, human kind. Marx is right here. 
of a tr what, what human beings are truly are. This is what he is explaining. He says, let us suppose that we had carried out production as human beings, like real human beings, mm -hmm. not what we are in capitalism. Each of us would have in two ways affirmed himself and the other person. What does he mean? He means this. In my production, I would have objectified my individuality, its specific character, and therefore enjoyed not only an individual manifestation of my life during the activity, but also when looking at the object, I would have the individual pleasure of knowing my personality to the object, meaning when you make something. You get a joy out of what you make. Mm -hmm. You understand? You have a personal connection with what you make. Okay? He also goes on to say, in your enjoyment or use of my product, I would have the direct enjoyment both of being conscious of having satisfied a human need by my work. So not only when I work for myself, but even humans have the conscience to build things for other human beings and take joy in that. Mm -hmm. But that's not the same when you go to work. Most people who go to work do not take joy in what they're doing and are alienated from their work. Mm -hmm. Okay? Again, what am I saying? Well, we'll get into it. So Karl Marx is a real human being. He enjoys the product of his hand and even enjoys others who uh, partake in it because he has a special attachment to to the uh That's right. to the product. Deep down we know that we are uh you know what I'm saying, slaves if not consciously subconscious. Subconsciously. That's so right. that's you don't have that about same feeling for your work if if you you have full control over your labor then where you know that you're selling this to somebody else and you're not reaping the benefits or, you know what I'm saying, you're not doing it for your fellow brother or sister. Exactly. Just to highlight it, bro. Now we're going into the uh, manuscripts of Karl Marx. Same book, page 71. We're looking at the first form of uh, alienation. We proceed from an actual economic fact. Uh -huh. The worker becomes all the poorer the more wealth he produces. The more his production increases in power and range, the worker becomes an even cheaper commodity the more commodities he creates. How does, does this make sense to anybody? How does a man become poorer the more products he produces? Does anybody understand why? It's because the more products he produces, the richer his boss is. There you go. Okay. And the richer his value, but guess what? He gets paid the same way. Same way. So the higher your value goes up, the poorer you get because you're producing more, but you're you're staying at the same um, pay rate. Mm -hmm. That's okay. right. That kind of you that in you know, some type of marketing job, they come in and tell you sales was up. You know, mm -hmm. we done doubled in sales this year. That means you you just lost. Because you done made a lot of a lot more out of uh you that means you done you done gave a lot more of your life energy, but you got you got less back out of that more you put in. <laughs> I just tell yeah. yeah, it's funny, but at the end of the day it's, it's not funny. It's funny to us, but it's not funny. Exactly. It's not funny because we're all caught in this right now. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, yeah, just the highlight. The more objects the worker produces, the fewer can he possess, and the more he falls under the, the dominion of his product, capital. The capital. The more you fall under the dominion of your product, capital. What is he talking about? How do you fall under the dominion of your own, the own works of your hand? Let me, let me give you an example. In capitalism, when you work, right, you start to make burgers, right? Yeah. Most people are con in control of the object that they make. But in capitalism, it's almost like the, the thing you make control you. Once once somebody comes through the drive-thru line and you're making burgers, oh, time to make another burger. 
And then these burgers start coming, and it's like these burgers control your life to the point you're sick of burgers because every every two minutes you're making a burger. So it's like these burgers control your life, even though you the one that's creating it. In your mind, just consume as a, that's what you think about. Exactly, what you think about. You ever had a dream about your job? Like you go to sleep and you dream that you still working Doing whatever it is that she's doing. Exactly. I mean, that that's a good point. That's like the Charlie Chaplin movie about the modern life. Same thing. Where you working even when you're at home because it's so consumed with it. Okay. Uh, are you on the phone? Yeah, sorry at the bottom and keep going. Yeah. For all this premise, it is clear that the more the worker spends himself, the more powerful the alien objective world becomes which he creates over against himself. The poor he himself, his inner world, becomes. The less belongs to him at his own. It is the same in religion. Uh The more man puts into God... So he said it's the same as religion. The more... He's giving the comparison here, okay? He's saying... That the more a man puts into the object, the less he becomes, okay, in the workplace. But now he's repairing, he's comparing it to religion. The more a man puts into God, what? The less he retains in himself. So, and this is and this is true in religion because they say let go and let God. So when you let God do it, you're not doing anything. You understand know what, what I'm saying? The same in the workplace, okay? When you're put all this uh, power into the object, the less you become. When you're putting your life force into these objects, right. the less you become. Because in religion, they got that abstract view of God or that alien, uh, alienated view. Exactly, <laughs> alienated view. Go, keep going. The more man puts into God, the less he retains in himself. The worker puts his life into the object, but now his life no longer belongs to him but to the object. Hence, the greater this activity, the greater is the worker's lack of object. The greater is the the greater is the activity. I hope that makes sense. The worker puts themselves into the object they make. Okay, when I make something, my energy is transformed from my body to an object outside of me. You understand what I'm saying? So, these when when the workers are separated from the fruits of their labor. They are alienated. When what I produce no longer belongs to me, I become alienated to my object. Those objects are an embodiment of our own energy. That's right. But objects don't belong to the worker, okay? They belong to the boss, to someone who didn't create it and probably will never see it, Mm -hmm. okay? Workers can't take home the products of their labor because look what happens. The police will come yeah. and arrest them. They say you were still. Exactly. And, and that's one of the main reasons police are set up anyway, to maintain private property. Okay. Mm-hmm. But if you ever painted, you understand, or wrote a book or sculpted, okay, or planted a garden or built something for your kids, okay, when you use your mind and your body to do something, you have a special connection to it. It's yours. That's right. But why doesn't this happen at work? Okay? For example, let me give you a sign of alienation of an object. People in Southeast Asia, okay, they make shoes for people. They sit in sweatshops and make shoes for people in Europe. Mm. Okay? Shoes that they will never see. Okay? while they walk around barefoot in their community. But they're making all these shoes. That's right. All these shoes they're making these factories, they're alienated from these shoes, and they walk around barefoot. This is alienation at its finest, uh, Marx explains, okay? This is not how mankind is naturally. Mankind naturally, if they make shoes, they make it for themselves. So why do they can make the shoes for themselves? Why? Because of private property. And, there you go. And capitalism, mammonism, what what we call it. Okay. So they removing the landmark. Removing the landmark. Exactly. 
But again, we can look at the total opposite of this. The Amish, okay? The Amish produce for their own use and for their own community, mm-hmm. okay? And they're not alienated from their product because, why? They have separated themselves from communism, I mean capitalism and manmanism, yeah. okay? And they live communally as we read those Indians did in the beginning. There you go. Okay. But, for example, we're gonna, I'm going to show you how unnatural this is, where people produce things that they don't own. Let, picture a lion going out on a hunt, right? When he hunts a, 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 a wildebeest or an antelope and he, and he takes it down, mm-hmm. nature lets us know that that beast belongs to him. Okay, as soon as he took it down, he's going to feast on it. Mm-hmm. Now, picture in your mind that if he took that down and brought it back to a, a hyena or something, and every time he went out for a hunt, he would have to bring it back to a hyena. That is unnatural. Mm-hmm. Okay? That's unnatural. You would just not find that in nature. But we find that in, in mankind. Okay? And we consider it natural. But it's unnatural in itself. Because if all the lions just killed and brought it back to the hyena, their, their product no longer belongs to them. Their, all the work they put in for that kill no longer belongs to them, but it belongs to a hyena. You understand what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Which is, you cannot find in nature. That's why we know it's unnatural. Okay? It's unnatural. So, like you said, the worker becomes poor the more he produces because the worker works more and the boss gets wealthier. Okay? but does not even work for it, <laughs> okay? That's right. What makes us human is we live off of what we create, okay? But in capitalism, we don't live off of what we create. The boss does, and the boss is what they offer of what we create. Go ahead and finish that. Did you finish the highlight? Whatever the product of his labor is, he is not. Therefore, the greater this product, the less is he himself. So the greater the product, the less he is himself because the boss gets it and he stays the same. That's right. So his value goes up, but he gets poor because he produces more, but he gets less than what he produces. That's right. The more you produce, the uh, the more uh, your you know, worth, really. And your wages come <laughs> up, people get laid off. Exactly. All kind of things. Why? Because... If you can produce this much in, in a less amount of time, you know what I'm saying, we only need 10 of y'all, you know what I'm saying, we can let, if we had 20, we can let the other 10 go. Exactly. That's a great point. So, we see. Go ahead and finish that. I'm sorry. Just to highlight it. Yeah, I finished this. Okay. Go over here. No, nah, you good right there. So, we see the first part of alienation of the working in the capitalist system is the worker from his product from the end result, okay? Like I said, if the lion killed the beast, the end result is that beast sitting there. Now, he would have to, or the uh, tribal lions would have to give that to a hyena. That's unnatural. We wouldn't see that in nature. So the first part of alienation of the worker in capitalist society is him being separated from his product. The second form of alienation what we're about to read is the worker from the labor process from the process of him even making the final product. Mm -hmm. Go ahead and pick it up at, um, let me see. Pick it up right here under. Okay. You sound right? Yeah. Yeah. Just keep going. But the estrangement is manifested. When you hear estrangement, it's the same as alienation. Not only in the result, but in the action of production within the producing activity itself. So, not only in the result, meaning the final product, but in the activity itself. Yeah, keep going. How would the worker come to face the product of his activity as a stranger? How is that? Go ahead. Were it not that in the very act of production, he was estranging himself from himself? So, even in the action of work, you're alienating yourself from yourself. Go ahead. The product is after all but the summary of the activity 
of production. So the final product is nothing but the summary of the production that went behind the product. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if you make a painting, that's just the summary of all the action that went into doing the paint, the painting itself. That's it. Okay, go ahead. If then the product of labor is alienation, production itself must be active alienation. So if the product is alienated, then the action itself must be active alienation, meaning even your activity does not belong to you. Go ahead. Production itself must be active alienation. The alienation of activity. The activity of alienation. Uh -huh. And the estrangement of the object of labor is merely summarized the estrangement, the alienation, and the activity of labor itself. So what he is saying here is that basically the labor process, okay, you are separated from it. It's not even yours anymore. Do you understand what I'm saying? Instead of the work being a process, of a want or a need for mankind, okay? Because that's what we work for, for a want or a need. This work is forced upon us, okay? For survival. For survival. This work is forced upon us. You can't tell me most people want to be cashiers, okay, or in an assembly line all their life. Okay, I don't think that's what your purpose for your life is, but most of your life gets spent on that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Keep reading. When then constitutes, what then constitutes the alienation of labor? Yeah. First, the fact that labor is external to the worker. In other words, it does not belong to his essential being. So the labor does not even belong to your being. This is And this is what your bosses purchase. They purchase your labor power. That's what it's called. The ability for you to work, I'm going to pay $10 an hour. No matter what you produce, if you produce in two hundred dollars an hour, I'm gonna pay you ten dollars an hour. Mm -hmm. And there's no reason for the the boss to pay you two hundred dollars an hour if that's what you produce, because they would make no profit off of you. That's right. Go ahead. That in his work, therefore, he does not affirm himself, but denies himself. Does not feel confident, but unhappy does not develop freely his physical and mentally in energy, but mortifies his body and ruins his mind. So you ruin your mind. When, when your labor is forced upon you and you're no longer freely laboring, you start to uh, deny yourself, okay, because someone else is controlling you and controlling what you do, when you do it, what time you do it. Okay, keep going. And then, you know, you just start uh, not being human anymore. Yeah, and what, that's the last part of alienation we're going to get to, that you fall out from even being human. You're alienated from your own species, okay, One under this capitalist system. But like you said, you're already two steps ahead. But go ahead and finish that out. The worker, therefore, only feels himself outside his work. He only feels himself outside of his work, okay? So you're only at home in your leisure time, when you're outside of work. This is when you feel yourself. Okay, go ahead. And then his work feels outside himself. So when you're in work, you don't feel like yourself when you're at these jobs. Go ahead. He is at home when he is not working. He is at home when he is not working. Yeah. And when he, when he is working, he is not at home. Go ahead. His labor is therefore not voluntary, but coarse. It is forced labor. It is therefore not the satisfaction of a need. It is merely a means to satisfy needs external to it. Its alien character emerges clearly in the fact that as soon as no physical or other compulsion exists, labor is shown like the flesh. Yes. Yeah. External labor, labor in which man alienates himself, is a labor of self-sacrifice or mortification. Lastly, the external character of labor for the worker appears in the fact that it is not his own, but someone else's, that it does not belong to him, that in it he belongs not to himself, but to another. So your labor, you in the capitalist system, 
do not belong to yourself. That's yeah. right. So, yeah, have you ever wondered why in, in you have at your job a human resource department? Human resources. That's good. Well, what does that mean to you? Ain't those the people that hire people? Or? Yeah. But what does human resource mean to you? Okay, because human resources are what they, uh, and I'm speaking in real terms, human resources are tools they use. There you go. Okay. For their benefit. That's like, now, uh, like wood resources. Exactly. You have earth that come from trees. Exactly. Exactly. Well, you have a resource of iron and, and a re- resource of wood. There you go. But in capitalism, they have a resource of what? Human. <laughs> okay. So showing you, you're just a tool. You're just an animal. Just as a farmer has a resource in his animal. Okay. That's what we have been reduced to. Okay. Let me see. Uh go ahead and do it right down there. Okay. Just as in religion, the spontaneous activity of the human imagination of the human brain and the human heart operates independently of the individual that is, operates on him as an alien. So, so just like in religion, again, he's comparing religion, how when we say, oh, man, you know, even Christ said to Peter, man, you know, uh, Satan, get behind me. Because your actions don't belong to you, they belong to who? <laughs> Say Okay. So he comparing how the labor process no longer belongs to you in a capitalist society, just as in religion. Your actions either belong to God or they belong to Satan. Okay. Putting up with the spirit that's exactly. behind that's, that's behind us. Exactly. And given that yeah, the spirit control your actions, you no longer control your actions, basically. Mm-hmm. Is attributed to that. Correct. Okay. So keep going. That is, operates on him as an alien, divine or diabolical activity. So if it be divine or diabolical, if it be God or the devil, it's something outside of you that controls you, basically what he's saying. Go ahead. In the same way, the worker's activity is not his spontaneous activity. It belongs to another. It is the loss of his self. Okay. Read that last word. As a result, therefore, man, the worker, no longer feels himself to be freely active in any but his animal functions. So he don't feel to be what? Active. Active. No, the worker no longer feels himself to be freely active. Freely active, except in what? His animal functions. Functions. What do animals do? They eat. Well, go ahead. Uh huh. Drinking. Drinking. Procreating. This is when you only feel free. When you're at home and you get to eat, you get to drink, you get to mate with your wife or your husband. This is the only time you feel free. Just like animals. After they work a hard day's work, guess what? They get fed corn for going out in the, and guess what? They get to chill. They get to procreate with their uh, other bees. Yeah. They get to sleep. This is when you feel uh, free. That's right. And you look for uh, fleshly pleasures and things of that nature. Exactly. That's why we got such a uh, high rate of people on drugs. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? That's why we got all these, uh, you know, procreation or high, where you have people having sex, prostitution, things of that nature. Yeah, because that's what people are seeking. Exactly. So. Before we get to this last alienation, let's go back to the Bible real quick. Right on. Smoking and drinking. Yeah. And go to Job 24 because we're not only reading this out of um, political economists. Job even witnessed the same thing. Okay. Job witnessed the same thing. So. Job 24, pick it up at verse 1. Why, same times are not hidden from the Almighty, do they that know him not see his days? Verse 4. They turn the needy out of the way, 
The poor of the earth hide themselves together. These are the capitalists that do this. Go ahead. Behold, as wild asses in the desert, go they forth to their work, rising bee time for a prey. Mm -hmm. The wilderness yieldeth food for them and for their children. Go ahead. They reap everyone his corn in the field. Uh huh. And they gather the vintage of the wicked. Yeah. They call. Hold the, on. They gather the what? Other, the vintage of the, the wicked. Mm -hmm. Okay. What does verse um? I'm sorry. Verse ten say. They cause him to go naked without clothing, and they take away the sheep from the hungry, which make all within their walls. And trees their wine press. So they make oil within their walls and they tread their wine presses. These are the workers, okay, who are going hungry. But they are doing the work. That's right. And they do what? And they suffer thirst. They suffer thirst. Go ahead. Man grown from out of the city, and the soul of the wounded cries out. Yet God led not folly to them. So people think it's capitalism thriving. Oh, man. People think capitalism of God. Because the Most High has not laid folly to them. But these are who? Verse 13. They are of those that rebel against the light. They know not the ways thereof, nor abide in the path thereof, nor abide in the path thereof. Okay? So we see Job. The people are still was alienated in Job's day. They made the wine presses, but or, or they tread the wine presses, but they didn't get to partake of the uh, wine. Right. Because uh, Israel started following the ways of the nations around them. Exactly. Like the Egyptians and Babylonians. So, I mean, they started to uh, fall into those same feudalistic, capitalist mindsets. Exactly. Which is why Israel is not here today. And that's why they were destroyed. Egypt was destroyed. So was Babylon. Yep. You are correct. So we're going to look at this third aspect of alienation, and then we're going to get out of here with one last scripture. The third aspect of how a worker is alienated from his, himself, mm -hmm. mankind. Okay. Right here. Yeah, just start right here. Uh, right there. Yeah. We have yet a third aspect of a strange labor to deduce from the two already considered. Uh -huh. Man is a species being, and what man, and what he means by species being is man is a being that recognizes his species as a whole. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Not only because in practice and in theory he adopts the species as his object, his own as well as those of other things, but in this is only another way of expressing it. But also because he treats himself as the actual living species. Because he treats himself as a universal and therefore a free being. Universal and free being. Okay. Right here. And then how down. The life of the species, both in man and in animal, consists physically in the fact that man, like the animal, lives on in on in in, in organic. organic nature. And the more universal man is compared with an animal. Uh huh. So the comparison between man and animal is that we live off of nature, okay? What does that mean? That means that nature is a part of us. We cannot labor without nature. How would you do work without a nature to work on, okay? Well, another quote that Mark said is, uh, what is life without activity, okay, other than activity? Life is nothing but activity, okay? What is life if everything was or nothing was active, okay? So... Nature is a, 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 a what's the word I'm looking for? Just a, a, an extension of mankind. I've got like that. Physically, man lives only lives only on these products of nature, whether they appear in the form of food, eating, clothes, a dwelling, or whatever it may be. Uh huh. The universality of man is in practice manifested precisely in a universality which makes all nature his inorganic body. So all nature is basically an extension of the human body because this is how we create our world. That's right. Okay. Off of nature. And we are a part of And we are part of nature. So we can't we can't exclude ourselves out of nature. 
Okay. So all of nature is a part of us. We are part of nature. Go ahead, right there. Right. Uh-huh. Nature is man's inorganic body. Nature that is in so far as it is not itself the human body. Many lives. Li- man. Man lives on nature. Means that nature is his body. So what what Karl Marx is saying is basically that nature is part of the human body because this is what we live off of. We cannot survive without nature. That's right. Okay. We need the trees, you know, and the water. Water. We need more shelter, food, mm. et cetera. Okay, keep going. With which he must remain in continuous intercourse if he is not to die. Uh-huh. That man's physical and spiritual life is linked to nature means simply that nature is linked to itself. For man is a part of nature. So just like the brother said earlier, man is a part of nature. So the first two alienations we talked about, the alienation of objects of labor from the, the worker, plus the, the, the alienation of the labor process, which all these are deal with nature, okay, alienates us from the species of man, which we are going to learn in a second, okay? Because man is meant to be able to choose and direct his own labor. This is what mm-hmm. man is for, and this is human nature, okay, to choose your own and direct your own labor, okay? But in, in a capitalist society, labor is imposed upon us, okay? The essence of man, what Mark is saying here, is to be free and to work nature as we choose to. That's right. Okay. And free of others telling us what to do. Go ahead. And, uh, where did you stop? Uh, just right there. Go ahead. And estranging for man, one, nature, and two, himself, his own, his own act of function, his life activity, estranges labor, estranges the species from man. So he's saying when you're estranged from what makes you human, meaning your life activity, for example, what makes a lion a lion? By his actions and how he interacts with nature, that's how you know that's a lion. Mm -hmm. You want to see a lion doing what an elephant do in his life activities. So what makes us human? Mm -hmm. Okay? Our activities are what project us of being human. Okay? How we think and how we consciously uh, manipulate nature, how we work with nature. Just like a lion goes and hunts, he crouches, he lives in uh, brushes. This is lion nature, okay? So this is how we know what a lion is. I'm going to love that today. Exactly. So we have lost our own nature by the process of this capitalist yes, system. We have lost what makes us human by freely coming up with our ideas. Okay, and choosing to direct and do our labor as we choose. If I want to make bows, this is what I should do with my life. This is what makes me human. Mm-hmm. Now, when you start to put me into a robotic machine, I no longer become human. Yeah. Just like we said with the lions, we get we gave an example of the lions. If you've seen a lion a tribe or a, a pack of lions or a pride, I believe they call them of lions hunting down deer or hunting down antelopes, and they all brought it back to an elephant. That that becomes no longer a lion because that's not what lions do. You understand know what I'm saying? Yeah, something, else. something else. Because you have just separated yourself from the act activity or the life activity of what lions do. Mm-hmm. Just as humans have supplanted themselves from the life activity of natural humans or the human nature. Yeah. And this is what Marx is describing. So we become alienated from our own nature when you work in in this capitalist society. Yeah. Is that uh yeah. How they say if uh, if you put a steak in front of an ape and an ape eats a steak or something like that. Well, apes, apes don't eat steak? Uh, I don't know, man. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. That's what I know. That's what I'm saying. Exactly. That would be something unnatural. Mm-hmm. Go ahead and write that. Man. Start from right yeah. here. For in the first place, labor, life activity. Meaning your life activity, the work that you do, 
Like the lion hunts, that's his labor. That's his life activity. Go ahead. Productive life itself mm-hmm. appears to man merely as a means of satisfying a need, mm-hmm. the need to maintain the physical existence. Yet the product, the productive life is the life of the species. It is a life engendering life. Uh-huh. The whole character of a species is species character is contained in the character of its life activity. So a ho- the, the character of a species is contained in its, how it acts throughout life. Mm-hmm. Okay, this is how you, like I explained earlier, that's how you know an elephant's an elephant. A yeah. horse is a horse, a pig is a pig. A human is a human by what? Well, Mark says by consciously choosing and directing your labor. Yeah. You understand? So they all have the same characteristics. Exactly. Go ahead. And free. Conscious activity is man's species character. So free conscious activity is what Marx says is human's natural character. Your own conscious, your free conscious, meaning nobody's controlling your conscious, okay? You freely coming up with your ideas and your labor. Mm-hmm. This is what man's life activity is, what Marx is explaining. Go ahead. Life itself appears only as a means to life. The animal is immediately identical with its life activity. And that's what we've been explaining. An animal is immediately identified by its life activity. If you see a bird flying, catching worms, that's what birds do. Okay. Now, if you see another uh, 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 ape flying and acting and catching worms, you would think that's a bird, not a dang ape. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Because of his life activity. That's right. Or if you see people, if you see people hunting down people like uh, lions hunting down antelope, then you're gonna you're gonna look at people as beasts now. As That's beasts. Because of that beastly nature that they have within themselves. Exactly. So again, when you go to work, okay, in a capitalist society, you don't control. And when you don't control your actions, that piece of your, your human being, okay, is taken away from you, okay? Your capacity, your capacity as a human being, okay, meaning how you can fully develop as a human. Mm-hmm. And capitalism is stagnated, and, and you're basically deformed in capitalism. Because a portion of your life doesn't belong to you. Right. Eight hours of your life a day, 40 hours a week belong to somebody else. That's, that's, a, that's a big portion. That's a third of your life. For most of your life. A third of your life belongs to somebody else. And the, and the other third, you're sleeping. Right. Okay? The other third, you're sleeping. Mm-hmm. So it deforms your human nature and it deforms humanity as a whole where humans are not able to live to their full capacity in and seek after what they want to seek after because a third of your life is controlled by somebody else. Okay? That's why the system must be brought down. Okay? Well, some people will say, well, you know, uh, well, I wanted to be a nurse. You understand? Or I chose, I'm I'm fine. This is what I wanted to be, a nurse in, in this system. But, again, say you wanted to be a nurse your whole life. You went to school to be a nurse. And now you work in a, a hospital. Yeah. Okay. So the activity which you train, the activity which you train for in school, okay, to which we give the greatest amount of time, okay, of our life, and which we use to identify who we are as a person, okay, does not even belong to us. Once you once you graduate from school. And you say this is what your whole life you've been uh, working to do. Once you find that job, that your time and your activity, your products no longer belong to you. Okay? It does not belong to us, but it's controlled by another person. Mm -hmm. So you say this is what you wanted to do, but you no longer control your actions. You no longer control when you want to do it. The hospital controls when you come in. When you clock out, what you gonna do? How you gonna do it? When you gonna do it? So, 
I don't believe that's what you really wanted to be your whole life, even though you, you convinced yourself. Yeah, if you wanted to nurture mankind, you want to be a nurturer, that's natural. Exactly. That's natural. You're right. So, when did you leave off on that? We got left off at uh, conscious life is activity from animal life. Is right here. Well, well, that's good on that. So, basically, what what the point is is that society even in the the what we read at the beginning, the uh, earliest Indian society that Columbus ran into, society when they first start, they organize work and distribution. These are the two main things to set up any economy. You got to organize who's going to do what and who's going to get what. Okay, we are even alienated from that process in capitalism. Okay, we don't even think like that. As far as we think is uh, basically uh, where I'm going to work. And how much they're going to pay. Right. You understand? We are, we are alienated from the process of distribution and who going to do what. Okay? The whole, we're, in, we're alienated from the production and distribution process. Okay? Well, we just become uh, wage slaves. Wage slaves. You know, exactly. So we sacrifice years of our lives to work that we don't care about. Okay? In this society. To do things to make money for someone else. Okay, because this is what mammonism, capitalism demands. Okay, labor is no longer a satisfaction of our needs. Like an animal labors to hunt because he's hungry. That's a sad, he's laboring to satisfy his needs. This is what natural man does. But in capitalism, we no longer labor to satisfy our needs. Okay, or to develop our mental and physical capabilities to develop fully as a human. Okay. We are hindered and retarded in that process due to this mammonist society. Yeah. Okay. And I did want to read some in a capital, but I am not. What I just wanted to read to finish this out is what will happen to this uh, society in Revelation chapter 19. Because a lot of people take the Bible as a religious book. We believe it to deal with politics and economics, and life in general, okay? Mm -hmm. Not so much religion as people know it, okay? Let's see what religion has to do with what we're about to read here, and then this will be the last. Revelation 19, pick it up at verse 1 when you get there, bro. And after these things, I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Hallelujah, salvation, and glory. My fault, my fault, brother. 18, Revelation 19. 18, I'm sorry. And after these things, I saw I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become the habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit, in the cage of every unclean and hateful bird. And, and, and like we've seen with Columbus in the beginning, and how he came to these Indians who were, who really didn't know disease, okay, who were generous, and what happened to them? So when when you see what they call civilization in Europe, okay, destroy a, a peaceful and a, a communal sharing community, you could look at that European nation and it's the same as this that what Babylon is speaking of. Okay. Every foul spirit. That's right. Okay. A cage of every un unclean thing and a hateful bird. Hmm. Okay. And this is the same today. Go ahead. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Uh -huh. And the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. How? Why have the kings of the earth committed fornication with them? Because they are seeking that same mammon. That's right. Okay. Go ahead. And the merchants of the, the earth. Who? The merchants. Who are the merchants? The capitalists. The capitalists. Your bosses. What have these bosses done? And the merchants of the earth. What they do? Are wax rich. Through the abundance of her delicacy. Through the power of her luxuries. These people have waxed rich. What does this have to do with religion? Okay. How has Babylon made merchants rich? 
How have the merchants gotten rich? Everything we have read today, how they exploit the worker, how they have treated workers as animals, commodities, tools. Okay? And if you don't believe it, we're going to read it right here. Uh, verse 9. And the kings of the earth who have committed fornication and lived delicious deliciously with her. How, is it deli how are you living deliciously off her? Because most people say, well, Babylon, the Roman church. Well, how is all the kings of the earth living deliciously off of the Roman, Roman church? church? Okay. Good. This is not what it's talking about. It's talking about the system of exploitation, That's right. which has been around since Cain, okay, mm -hmm. which was at the height in the old times with uh, the imperialist Nimrod. That's right. And the kings of the earth who have committed fornication and, and to live deliciously with her shall bewail her and lament for her when they shall see the smoke of her burning. Of whose burning? Why, why are merchants crying at this time? Why, why doesn't it say priests and your uh, nuns? If this is the Catholic Church, why is it not saying your priests and your nuns are crying right here? Right. It's saying your merchants. Why? Because when this system of mammonism, capitalism, who has been oppressing and turning humans into beasts and have alienated humans from mankind. And not the humans are not even human anymore. Once that falls, these merchants are going to cry. They're going to lose all their power that they had over man. Exactly. All the manipulation that they was doing to uh, leading man like the rabbit chasing the cat on the stick. Yep. Verse 10. Standing afar off for the fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, the great city, Babylon, that mighty city, for one hour is thy judgment come. For one hour. It's not a literal hour, and it's not a literal city. An hour just means a short time. City just means a, 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 a body or a, 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 a power. Okay. Yeah. And the merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn over her. The who? Again, we're talking about merchants. We're talking about capitalists. What does the Bible have to do with merchants? I thought this was a religious book. It should be talking about priests, nuns. <laughs> you understand? Religious systems. Religious systems. Okay. But we're talking about merchandise of gold. Go ahead. For no man buys their merchandise anymore. But no man buys their merchandise anymore. Why are they not buying? Because it has collapsed. Go ahead. The merchandise of gold and silver and precious stone and of pearl and fine linen and purple and silk and scarlet and all dying wood and all manner vessels of ivory and all manner vessels of most precious wood and of brass and of iron and marble and cinnamon in odors, in ornaments, in frankincense, in wine, in oil, in fine flour, in wheat, in beef, in sheep, in horses, in chariots, in slaves, in souls of men. And slaves and souls of men. This is what we have been reading about. All these things. Mm -hmm. Okay? All these things. The merchants of these things which were made rich by her. Okay? They were made rich by all these things. And it says of the slaves and souls of men. And we just have read about the souls of men in this society and how you're alienated not only from the objects that you produce because according to economists, anything you produce belongs to you. That's right. Okay. But you produce it and it belongs to another man. You have been alienated from even the process. You don't control your own how you're going to work. Somebody tells you how you're going to work. And how you going to do it? And then we learned that both of those put together equals you just alienated from being a human. You are no longer human. Okay? Just like we explained animals would be no longer animals if they stopped doing what animals do. <laughs> okay? So I had to cut a few things out just for time's sake. But brother... Earlier, you know, I let him comment. He he was going into some things, but we appreciate the brother's call. So um, with that, that was basically the summation of the 
the teaching of just alienation of the worker within the capitalist system. Mm-hmm. So um, I see we have some callers. Nobody has pressed the number one for a comment or a question. So okay, I, okay no we have one one question. <laughs> Let me get to you. Uh, seven five seven. You had a question or a comment? Yeah, brother Blue. This is brother Eugene. Hello, brother. Sure. How you doing? I'm doing all right, and you? Pretty good, pretty good. I had a couple comments, but uh, it would probably take too long, so I'm going to try to take the one that's most urgent in my mind anyway. Um, the, when you were mentioning the fact that uh, you were making a distinction between the capitalistic system and the uh, Catholic Church, um, it's kind of like, and I, I get this kind of, frequently from you guys as far as making light of them or kind of pushing them aside, you don't realize that's one and the same. Uh, the, the Catholic Church and the capitalistic system, they, they go hand in hand. And the reason why I say that is because when the, uh, the Catholic Church came, became a world power, you had the nations, but the nations answered to her. Kings could not be placed into their kingship without the approval of the of the Pope. That went on for 1,260 years. Now, when the, when she received her deadly wound, her deadly wound was healed. But the thing is, her power never failed because it says that once that one, when that beast came into power, that beast would be in power until Jesus comes. And so it's, it's, you have to look at it. It's not, you can't just say it's just the Pope because that's just a continuation, like you said, of the capitalistic system going all the way back to Nimrod. It's just that the fact that now, after all those other uh, kingdoms have gone by the wayside, we still got this one last kingdom that is uh, fueling that whole system up to now to where, you know, because when they talk about a, a church, it, 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 talk, it talks about it like in a female way. Like you got, you got the true church and the false church. So when it talks about in, in Revelation, when it says something about uh you know, you know, getting rich off her delicacy. It's the, the Catholic Church, through many of the secret societies, rule the world through the banking system, the economic system, the political system, the religious system. It's all together, and and they they all have come together wanting to put the papacy as the head. They're doing it right now through the ecumenical movement. Everybody wants to come together. They want to get rid of the doctrine. And come all come together under love, and and have the Pope as the head. That that is the whole crux of the uh, the ecumenical movement. But it's it's not just a, it's not just the religious portion of it. That's just one portion. The Catholic Church, basically, they use other organizations to keep themselves from getting the finger pointed at them. But they run the whole shebang. And everybody reports back to the papacy. The papacy or the, the, the Roman Catholic Church is the richest organization on the on the planet. And the reason being that is they don't just get the donations from the parishioners. They're getting it from the bankers and the, the, the businessmen and the politicians. And, and all. Because you got to remember how they made most of their money through indulgence. So you have all these rich people trying to pay, you know, pay their way into heaven with all all kinds of money, giving it to the church. So it's not just the lowly parishioners that are putting in their little money in, you know, every Sunday, this and that. This, these, these are, you know, the, the, the wealthiest people in the world are contributing to the wealth of the Catholic Church. So uh, it, it's something that you have to, you have to keep your eyes on, on the, the fact that when you're talking about the papacy, or the Roman Catholic Church, you're talking about capitalism. That's all it is because it's it's all about uh, using uh, and deceiving the, the the common people. They did that for 1,260 years, and they're still doing it up to today through other organizations. So I, I just need to put that out there to say that you can't take light of that because basically that's where everybody is, is, is kind of like, 
kind of like a funnel. Everybody's going right down into that that ecumenical funnel, right into to to the, to the grass of the papacy. And they are they are they are strong. I mean, they're they're the strongest organization on the on the planet. Um, if you look at what all they actually do control, and uh, that that's that's pretty much all I can say on that. Yeah. Well, well, those are excellent points, and I pretty much agree with what you said. As far as you know, I don't know if we make light of it, but what what we what or what I want to say I understand is that the, yeah, the Catholic Church and capitalism run hand in hand, but capitalism is is or or I, I want to say the like the like you said, capitalism goes back way long ago. So the papacy is just something that falls under capitalism. Not that capitalism falls under the papacy, if you understand what I'm saying. So when, of course, you, like you said, they ruled for 1,260 years, and of course the Pope won't be here until until the uh, the saints take over the earth. I, I agree with that. But, yeah, but, but, but what I want, like, like I said, I don't even disagree with what you, anything you're saying, I think, but what, what I want to stress is that you know, uh, there's like like America will go into Iraq, and the first thing they'll put down is the Catholic Church. Mm-hmm. So I agree with what you're saying, but the thing is that you have non-believers as well who don't deal with the Catholic Church who are still getting drunk off the wine of this wrath, which is capitalism. So it's not just strictly dealing with religion. From what I understand, because you could have your atheists who still seek after mammon, which is making this whole world go down the drain. Right. And just, uh, well, you mentioned something about the uh, unbelievers. Most of the religious people are unbelievers. It's, 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 you know, they're they're in the same uh, they're in they're in the same boat as the atheists because they don't believe in Christ uh, the uh, the way they're supposed to. I mean, they might as well be atheists the way they're believing because they are all, like I said, they're all in that same boat. They do, they yeah, are not believers. No matter how they say they love the Lord, they they're non-believers. So, but uh, yeah. I, I I just need to put put that out. I'm not when I say you were kind of making light of it. I was. It's kind of like you might want to try to separate it and and just try yeah. to separate capitalism from the papacy. When uh, all I'm saying is, it, like you said, it, it's it. You take you go from the papacy at the Nimrod and put your arm around that whole thing, and that's what you got. That that's one system. That's not two, three, four, five systems all together. Okay. That's all one system, and it's just so happened that the papacy is the head of that system. Whereas if we were living back right before, right after the flood, we would be in, under a uh, Nimrod system. But it's the, it's this whole same system. So uh, you know, if you, I, I guess I keep see, because I keep my eye on. The, on on the papacy because I know what they did with God's law, and 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 that's what has the world in such a turmoil right now because they changed God's law and the Bible says that they would do that, so that's 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 why I keep my eye on them for the, for the simple fact that I know that they have deceived the whole world by changing the law, but you got to also like I said the way you brothers are talking about you know it's it's a whole it's the it's the same system you, you know the devil has his system. God has his system. Nothing changes. There's nothing new under the sun. Yeah. So, yeah. Oh, right. yeah. so uh, you know, I mean, I'm, I understand exactly what you're saying, bro. And you're right. That's, that's all one system. But just to give an example, because a lot of times when people hear the Bible, they always look at it as uh, just a religious thing. You know what I'm saying? But to even go a little bit deeper, look at that whole system, and it's it's deeper than just, it's not religious, and it's not just attacking on religious order, but it's it's talking about politics in the economical system, which is what people, the majority, rarely see, that uh, it's, it's not about Proving that you know a doctrine is correct than a next doctrine, but it's showing two different ways of life. Mm-hmm. 
and how one way of life is to exploit mankind and another way is to love and cherish uh, life, period. So just making that distinction to show that example of the difference between it's not just about religious rituals, you know what I'm saying, that the Bible is against, but the Bible is against a whole political, economical system or the whole uh, government of this world. Exactly. So, yeah, definitely, I mean, we definitely always appreciate the wise brother Eugene's cause. Mm-hmm. He always, um, you know, if we slip up, he puts us in our place. And, uh, <laughs> we definitely we definitely appreciate you. And just clarifying, you know, because sometimes, you know, we might come off sounding a way we don't want to sound. So, right. you know, if we always there to hold us up and we appreciate it. And um, again, uh, I see the you know, I, you know, I appreciate you guys. No, definitely. You know, it, it's just reciprocal. It's definitely mm-hmm. reciprocal. So, right. Um, okay, so I guess uh, I know I see the brother, the brother from England, on my boy Aaron Lawrence. Uh, I don't know if he had a question. I, I don't see you pressing number one, so I'm not going to put you on the spot or anything. So, you know, we just thank all the listeners out there who listen. I know especially Aaron. I know he up late, 2, 3 o'clock in the morning where he at. And uh, the brother Eugene always on with us faithfully. And all the listeners who listen online, all the brothers who called in, the brother that called in earlier, I appreciate him as well. And um, until next time, we thank you. Shalom. Shalom. Wow, wow, wow.